Father in heaven, we need you. Lord, we understand, as the song said, it is under your wings that we are safely abiding. Though the night deepens and tempers are well, sheltered and protected, no evil can harm me. Resting in Jesus, in Christ, we are safe evermore. And Lord, the only way we're going to be saved is by remaining connected with Christ. And so, Lord, we need you. Help us to see our need of you. Lord, may we never get to the point that we cease to see our need. Because we are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And realize not that we are wretched Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So, Lord, we need that eye salve so that we can see today. Lord, we need that right raiment so we can be clothed. Lord, you told us to watch because when you come as a thief and you find us naked, they will see our shame. So Lord, we don't want to be naked. We want to be clothed with your righteousness. Not our own righteousness which is just filthy rags, but with the precious righteousness of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we need you. Speak to our hearts and minds this day as we dive into your word. Give us understanding, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. What must I do to be saved? Some may say, well, I know the answer. It's good to know the answer, but are you living the answer in your daily life? Today, we're going to look at this question. What must I do to be saved? And as we dive into this message, we're going to look at our first question. Why do I need Jesus? You know, a few years ago, I was at a radio station. I was on the, I was on the radio. It was back in 2009, 2009, 2009, 2010. I think it was the end of 2009, uh, where this particular gentleman, uh, came to the radio station. He began to say all these different things to the owner of the radio station. You know, I can bring millions to this station. And this guy, he was, he was a, a, supposed to be a preacher who uh, preached this prosperity gospel. And he said, I can bring millions to this station. I, I can bring a, a million dollars here, 20 million. And he was saying all this different type of stuff and putting it in the ears of the uh, radios, the owner of the radio station. And appealed to his covetous mind. And he listened and fell for all these things he was saying. And the only thing that uh, the owner had to do was sign this agreement. And in this agreement, this man was trying to scheme the owner of the station into turning the station all over to him so that he could take over. And so we was in the meeting, me and another gentleman. And we was in the meeting because the owner asked us to sit in with this meeting. His wife also was the manager of the station. So we sat in in the meeting and he was saying all this stuff. And the question was asked to him. Let me ask you a question. The person said. Why do I need Jesus? And this man claimed to be a minister of the gospel. He said, you know, I went to the seminary and all this and that. He said, OK, why do I need Jesus? You know what the man said? I can't answer that right now. He couldn't answer that question as to why you need Jesus. Romans 5 verses 12 and 14. This man claimed to be a minister of the gospel. 
But yeah, he didn't know the answer as to why we need Jesus. A simple question, simple answer. Even a Christian who was a babe, who has just surrendered their lives to Jesus, can get that answer. And this man who claimed I've been to the seminary and this and that, he couldn't even answer that question. Simple question, couldn't even answer it. Spirit of prophecy says the minister should not even preach another discourse until he knows he is converted. And how much so if he don't even know why he needs Jesus? Romans 5, verses 12 through 14. Now, brothers and sisters, if you don't understand and if you don't know why we need Jesus, you're going to leave here with that answer. Amen. Amen. Romans 5. Looking at verses 12 and also verse 14. We have it. Please say amen. amen. Romans 5, verses 12 and 14. It says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Let's look at another scripture. Romans 3, verse 23. Romans 3, verse 23. We need Jesus. Why? Because. We have all sinned. De uh, sin came into the world by one man. That was Adam. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. The Bible says, amen. amen. And Romans three, verse 20 tells us Romans three, verse 20 says. 23, excuse me, Romans three, verse 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So every single person in this room, including myself, we have all sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, when it says we have fallen short, we have missed the mark. What is the mark? The character of Christ. We've missed the mark. All of us. Nobody standing in this room can say that they have attained and they have reached the mark. We've all missed the mark. All of us. But there is one. <laughs> you didn't hear me. There is one. Go ahead, man. And his name is Jesus. He lived a perfect life, took upon himself our sinful nature, took upon himself our flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Jesus lived a perfect life with no sin, tempted in all points, yet he did not sin. And he told us in his word that we are to follow his example. So, yes, we have fallen short. But guess what? I'm going to show you today. He can give us power to reach the mark. Amen. 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 That's the God we serve. But the Bible tells us in Psalm 51, verse five, it says, behold, I was shaping in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's a cute little baby, isn't it? But that cute, precious little baby, if he has not taught how to fear God, and keep his commandments. He is not taught to love his neighbor as himself. That baby. You don't have to teach that baby how to how to snap back at someone and, and smack, uh, scratch somebody in the face. You have to teach that baby that, do you? You have to teach that that child to to lie. You don't have to teach that child to steal. I remember when I was a little child and stole some candy from the store. Nobody taught me how to do that. That was embedded in me, born in sin. Shapen in iniquity. And the only cure is found in Jesus. What is sin, brothers and sisters? We've been talking about sin. First John 3, 4. I've said it last week. I'm saying it again. Why? Because repetition deepens the oppression. Don't you know there's many people who don't even know the definition of sin? But the word of God tells us what sin is. It says, whosoever committed sin transgressive also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. What law? God's moral law, his Ten Commandments. There are two laws. There's the ceremonial law and there's the moral law. The ceremonial law points to the sacrifices and the ordinances that the children of Israel had to do, which pointed to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It was all connected with the sanctuary message. 
But when Christ died for us, we no longer have to sacrifice lambs anymore. That was nailed to the cross, brothers and sisters. Amen. But as at, when it concerning his moral law, this is what the Bible is talking about when it's talking about sin. His moral law, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is what the word is talking about, brothers and sisters. Sin is breaking God's commandments. Do we understand that so far, brothers and sisters? Romans 5, 13 says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not, it's not imputed when there is no law. So if there's no law, there could be no sin. But because there is a law, if you break that law, that is sin. What does that tell me? When the Bible says, as by one man, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, sin entered into the world. When the Bible tells me that, that tells me that in the beginning, there was a law. Amen. Amen. And Adam and Eve broke that law. And that law didn't just start. In the Garden of Eden, that law was in heaven. It is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Because the Bible tells me in Ezekiel chapter 28 concerning Lucifer, he was an anointed cherub that covereth. God said he had set him so. He sealeth up the sum full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, perfect in all his ways till iniquity was found in him. What is iniquity? Iniquity is sin. So sin took place in heaven. There can be no sin if there is no law. So what does that tell me? There was a law in heaven. And Satan, who was once Lucifer, broke that law. So brothers and sisters, sin is breaking God's law. And we have all broken that holy sacred law. One form of fashion. Amen. We've all fallen short. So reason number one as to why we need Jesus, why I need Jesus is because we have all sinned. Amen. Now I'm sitting there in that radio station and I'm hearing this professed minister of the gospel say, I, I can't get an answer right now. That you know what that tell me? He didn't know. He didn't even have a real experience. You know, that man is now in jail, in prison. That man is in prison. Him and his wife. For scheming in the name of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, if we're not careful. We can be deceived. There's no question about it. We need a savior. Brothers and sisters, apart from Christ, we are drowning in sin. In deep waters. Help! Help! And the only one that can help us is a savior. Psalm 130, verses 7 and 8. And how can you seek a savior if you don't see your need of the savior? How? It's impossible, brothers and sisters. Psalm 130, verse 7 and 8. Am I making sense this morning? Psalm 130, verses 7 and 8. Psalm 130, verses 7 and 8. When you have it, please say amen. The word of God says, let Israel Hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. That should make us rejoice. Doesn't matter what you have done, there is plenteous redemption. Doesn't matter. Lie, steal, kill, there is plenteous redemption. And the word of God continues, continues on in verse eight. He shall redeem Israel from some of his iniquities. It said he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Somebody say amen out there. What a savior. If you just cry to him for help, his hand is stretched out to save. He says, if any man come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. 
And if Jesus says that, how should we be to one another? We should be exactly the same. But hey, we're so quick to point the finger. Not even realizing you got three fingers pointed at you. And then you got another finger pointing up to God. Brothers and sisters, we got to look at ourselves. In the day of atonement, the children of Israel had to afflict their souls. You know what that means? They had to be critical with themselves. Are we being critical with ourselves? Are we being sharp and critical with one another? We need to be critical with ourselves and see if we're in the faith. We need to see our need, brothers and sisters. We really need to see our need. The Bible says in Matthew 1, and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name. What everybody? Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. What a savior. John 1, it says the next day, John, see of Jesus coming unto him and said, behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Don't you know? That the gospel is the wonderful simplifier of life's problems. Amen. You didn't hear me. Ahead, the gospel is the wonderful simplifier of life's problems. Right. Do we have racism in this state? Yeah. You better believe it. Believe. And it's strong in North Carolina too, brothers and sisters, where I'm from. <laughs> it's all down the South. Right. You better believe it, brothers and sisters. Now let me ask you a question. Is marching down the street uh, protesting, is that really going to get the hit the heart of the issue? Nope. Mm -mm. No, it's holding. <laughs> it's holding black lives matter sign going to deal with the issue. I mean, brothers, and sisters, I just got to be real with you. And let me just be even plainer, brothers and sisters. We can say, I mean, I, I, I want to be sensitive with the issue because this really is an issue. It really is a problem. Is. And we got to address it the way Christ would do it. Amen. Christ, you read in the Zion of Ages, he didn't seek any civil reforms. Amen. You didn't hear me. We say Christ is our example, right? Yes. He didn't seek any civil reforms because in doing that, that would not bring about the real solution. That's right. And these same brothers, some of these same brothers that say, Black Lives Matter are the same ones that run in the store and loot it. These same ones that says, man, they, they, they killed a Philando. They're the same ones that were, if they had the opportunity to have a gun, would rob the brother. We want to talk about when the, when the white officer kills the black brother, but what about when the black brother kills his own black brother? We want to deal with that, but what are we doing amongst ourselves? And I, you know, brothers and sisters, uh, to me, it, it, it makes no sense. You want to take black lives matter. What are we doing among our own selves, brothers and sisters? How can we bring about change if among our own selves we're not even unified? Brothers and sisters, I'm not taking away from what we have gone through as a race. Because it is, to be honest with you, back at home where I'm from, there's an older lady that's, that's, that has told, told me that there have been many unsolved murders of black men by white men. Just kill them and dump their bodies somewhere. Hundreds. So I'm not taking away from that at all, brothers and sisters. But the reality is the only thing that's going to the, the, the root of the problem. We got to hit the root of the problem. That's right. That's right. We, we got to hit the root of the problem. Yes, sir. Praise God for, what, what, for, for, for Martin Luther King. I'm not taking away from what he has done. Yes, sir. But brothers and sisters, even he didn't hit the root of the problem. Ahead, you know, I'm being plain. Ahead, it, it, it gave some rights to the blacks. Uh -huh. But did it deal with the root of the problem? No. How do we hit the root of the problem? How do we hit it? With the gospel, because it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that could turn a full out racist into one who loves his brother, his neighbor as himself. That's how we deal with the issue. 
And if we as a people were doing that, what we were supposed to do and following the blueprint, brothers and sisters, yes, sir. where would we be? God has given us a gospel that, brothers and sisters, is no respect of persons. That's right. That's right. Revelation 14, verses 6 to 7 says that this gospel will be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That's right. Go ahead, to everybody. That's right. Asian, African American, white. Latino, it doesn't matter. That's We're all precious in this sight. We teach that to our, little, uh, to our little children. Red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. Yes. If you peel off all of our skin, guess what? We got skeletons, we got muscle, we bleed the same blood, we all look the same. You take that apple. We just got a variety, brothers and sisters, that's all. You got red apples, you got green apples, you got yellow apples. But guess what? It's still an apple. You got green okra, okra. You got red okra. It's still okra. Go ahead, Have mercy. You got a variety of birds. You got uh, lions with different shades. Horses with different shades and colors. Cows with different shades and colors. And guess what? It's still a cow. It's still a horse. We're just a variety of people. God is a God of variety yes, and he loves every single one of us equally. Yes, so, brothers and sisters, the gospel is the wonderful simplifier of life's problems. Yourself, Let me move on, brothers and sisters. Uh, you know, I wasn't planning to talk about that, but that was just on my mind and heart, brothers and sisters. Yeah. We got to hit the real issue. Yes, sir. We got to hit the real issue. First Timothy one, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception that Christ Jesus came into the world to save what everybody sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am chief. Paul, I disagree with you on that. I'm the chief. I'm the chief. It's only by the mercy of God. I'm standing here today. I shouldn't even be up here, but it's because of God's grace. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace that he bestowed upon me is not in vain. And we all can raise our hand because we can all say we're the chief of sinners. God help us. Reason number two why we need Jesus is because Jesus has the power to save us. Amen. Because we can't save ourselves. How does Jesus save us from the penalty of sin. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Bro, says, I know what I just said earlier. Some, some will stone me. But it's the truth. We don't want to hear the truth. We want to be politically correct. Brothers and sisters, we got to get the truth. Let the truth cut lead the consequences to God. I know pastors and ministers who be ready to rip me to pieces after what I said, what I said. But brothers and sisters, we cannot be afraid. God told Jeremiah, the prophet, don't fear their faces. Don't be afraid of how they look. You think I'm afraid of how you're looking at me? By no means necessary. I'm not afraid, brothers and sisters. Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 7. Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 7. But I say it because I love you. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 7 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, and that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us unto the adoption of the children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted into beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Amen. Amen. Jesus saves us through his blood. The life is in the blood, the Bible says. Amen. So what does that tell us? Jesus poured out his life to save us. 
from the death we all deserve. Amen. Jesus came and did it just for you, just for me. First Peter one verses 18 and 19. We have it. Say amen. First Peter one verses 18 and 19. It says, for as much as ye know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, Christ. He redeemed us through his blood, not with money, but with his blood. He died and paid the price for us. He died and paid a price for our sins. And guess what? When a person buys something, he now owns it. And guess what? I am no longer the owner of that particular thing. He is. Amen. Amen. So Christ, he took upon himself our sins, paid for it with his own blood. Guess what? It no longer belongs to you. So guess what? You no longer have the right to go back and try to pick it up. Will you try to go back? What are you saying to God? What are you saying to Christ? Jesus, you need to get a refund. I love how E.G. Wagner put it in this small little booklet. Salvation in Jesus Christ. See, I got this book to get it somebody else. The Lord said, no, this book for you. <laughs> then you could give it to somebody else. Amen. Right. Notice what he says. Salvation in Jesus Christ. Page number two. I'm going to read this right here. I mean, this is this is some deep stuff here. Mm, mm, mm. Let me find it right here. This is. All right. Here it is. Page number six. Salvation in Jesus Christ, page number six by E.G. Wagner. Christ gave himself for our sins, Galatians 1, 4. That is to say he bought them and paid the price for them. This is a simple statement of fact. When we hear a man say that he gave so much for a certain thing, we know that that thing belongs to him because he has bought it. So when the Holy Spirit tells us, page number seven now, that so when the Holy Spirit tells us that Christ gave himself for our sins, we should be equally sure that they belong to him and not us. They are ours no longer and we have no right to them. That's what you're doing, trying to go back and pick it up. for. You better leave it to Jesus because you know what he's going to do with it. He done bought it so that he can what? Cast it in the depths of the sea. He bought it to throw it away. That's amazing. God's amazing grace. Page 172, paragraph three. It says it is through the infinite sacrifice and inexpressible suffering that our Redeemer placed redemption within our reach. He was in this world unhonored and unknown that through his wonderful condescension and humiliation, he might exalt man to receive eternal honors and immortal joys in the heavenly court. Somebody say amen out there. Amen. During his 30 years of life on earth and his heart was wrung with inconceivable anguish, the path from the manger to Calvary was shadowed by grief and sorrow, and he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, enduring such heartache as no human language can portray. He could say, he could have said in truth, behold, and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow. Hating sin with perfect hatred, he yet gathered to his soul the sins of the whole world. Guiltless, he bore the punishment of the guilty, innocent, yet offering himself as a substitute for the transgressor. The guilt of every sin pressed its weight upon the divine soul of the world's redeemer. The evil thoughts, the evil words, the evil deeds, of every son and daughter of Adam called for the retribution upon himself, for he had become man's substitute. Though the guilt of sin was not his, his spirit was torn and bruised by the transgression of men. And he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in 
him. God's amazing grace. Page 172, paragraph three. Somebody better say amen out there because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We need Jesus because we can't save ourselves. We need Jesus because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. We need Jesus because he can give us power to live a life of victory Amen. over sin. As a result of Christ's death on the cross, what did he provide other than forgiveness and redemption from the penalty of sin? Now, this part right here, brothers and sisters, gets deep. You ready for this? Yes, sir. Watch this, Brother Stevenson. This is going to get deep, brother. Amen. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Verses 7 through 11. Now, when I first understood this, I said, man, that's deep. Because it is, brothers and sisters. Let's look at this. Revelation chapter 12, verses, excuse me. Revelation chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 7 through 11. Amen. And we have it. Please say amen. amen. The word of God says, and there was war in where? Heaven. heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. That means they lost their positions. Amen. And the great dragon was cast out. Who is that dragon? That old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So Satan lost in heaven. Amen. Amen. Round one, he lost. Now round two is in verse 10. How do we know it's round two? Listen closely. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now, what did it say? Now is come sal what? salvation and strength. And the kingdom of our God and the power of his who? Christ. For the accusing of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives even unto the death. The Bible says they overcame by the blood of the lamb. So that the word of God tells us when did that salvation and strength came. When did it come? When Christ built his blood for us. Amen. So Satan lost in heaven. He lost at the cross. He wanted to see Christ suffer. He wanted him in pain, but he hated to see him die. Because in Christ's death, we have redemption. Amen. So Christ, so Satan lost in heaven. He lost at the cross. Brothers and sisters, in a 12 round bout, you got, I'm just, I'm just using this as an example, okay? I don't endorse these things, amen? You got Mike Tyson going against Evander Holyfield. Evander Holyfield has knocked out Tyson all 11 rounds. Except one more round to go. Now, in order for Tyson to win the fight, what must he do? He must TKO, knock his opponent out. What is Satan trying to do? He lost in heaven. He lost at the cross. He has one more round left. How do you think he feels? Look at verse 12. The Bible says, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. But woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that he had but a short time. He is angry and he's ready to knock you out. And you better be on your T's and Q's. You better be flying like a butterfly, stinging like a bee. Because this thing is real, brothers and sisters. I, I'm being serious. You better learn how to duck and dodge with the word of God and then saying in prayer. That's the only way we're going to make it. We're not going to make it any other way. But the word of God tells us that as a result of Christ's death on the cross, what did he provide for us other than forgiveness and redemption from the penalty of sin? The Bible tells us in Revelation 12, verse 10, it says, now is come salvation and strength. Let's look at it. Romans chapter five, verse six. Is this making sense, brothers and sisters? Romans 5, verse 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. 
Brothers and sisters, we had no time to give paddlum and skim milk. We had no time for that, brothers. Those days are long gone. You saw the clip. Them days are long gone, brothers and sisters. We're in the finals. This is it. Romans 5 verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You line this scripture up with Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 because at Revelation 12 verse 10 says, Now it's come salvation and strength. When did that come? The Bible tells us, not only in Revelation chapter 12, but in Romans chapter 5 verse 6, it says, When we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died. He what? Died for the ungodly. The strength came at the death of Jesus. Because before, we had no strength. Before, we had no power. Before, we had no remedy to, for the defects of our character. Before, brothers and sisters, we were in a miserable state. But because of what Christ has done, he has made a way of escape. And the only thing we got to do is tap into the power. That power was made available at the cross. What is Satan trying to do? He's trying to keep us from tapping into the power. And all everything he can do to keep us to tap from tapping into the power, he will do. This thing is real. What is this strength or power? John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. When you have it, please say amen. John chapter 12. Excuse me. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Brothers and we're in a real deal spiritual warfare. This is a battle. This, is, this war is more real than Vietnam, the Civil War, World War I, II, all the wars combined. It's, it's greater than all these wars. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we can't come playing around in this war. But you come on, on that battlefield playing around, Satan will take you out because he's not playing. That's amazing to me. Satan is not playing. He doesn't get no sleep. He is aggressive. We got to be just as aggressive as he is for the kingdom of God. If we had the same aggressiveness as Satan has to try to overthrow us. If we had that same aggressiveness for God, where would we be? We'll be home by now. But sadly. We are in a Laodicean slumber. Brothers and sisters, it's time to wake up. And the only thing that's going to wake God's people up is the straight testimony. Sent forth to the church of the Laodiceans, sent by the uh, given by the faithful witness, which is Jesus Christ. That straight testimony. Some will not be able to bear it. Some will rise up against it. Some will accept it and and and, and preach forth the bring forth the straight truth and lift up the standard. Amen. Amen. It's the straight testimony that's going to cause a division. Jesus said, I came out to send peace but a sword. It's this straight testimony that's going to weed out a lot of individuals. And this straight testimony must be preached. You're not going to see things being stirred up with skim milk sermons. We need the straight testimony. Amen. The Bible says in John 1 verses 12 and 13 says, but as many as received him, received Christ. To them gave he what? Power to become the sons of God, even in them that believe on his name, which are not born of, uh, of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So in other words, we receive Christ, we receive the power to become the sons and daughters of God. Amen. Amen. Now, what does it mean to be a son or uh, daughter of God? What can happen when we receive this power to become a son and daughter of God? First John 3 verses 1 through three, when we have it, say amen. First John chapter three, verses one through three, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now let's go to verses five and verse nine. Also, it says verse five. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. Verse nine. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. How much more plain does the word of God need to be? It says, for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So in other words, what is the strength of power? The power to overcome sin. When I receive Christ, the Bible says in John 1 verse 12, when I receive Christ, he gives me power to be a son or daughter of God. And when I am a son or daughter of God, as a result of receiving Christ into my heart, he gives me power to live a life of victory over sin. But you will not have this power if you don't believe you have it. In the same book, E.G. Wagner makes it very clear. The salvation is not a feeling. That's right. If you waited for you to feel that you are saved, how would you know? That's right. Your feelings are always changing. So true. One minute, I, I feel I'm saved. Next minute, I don't think I'm saved. You got to believe it by faith that you are saved. Now, what does it mean to sin not? Our Bibles are still in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Amen. It says, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. And ye know that it was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth have not seen him, neither have known him. Verse 7, key scripture. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is what? Righteous, even as he is righteous. So in other words, to do no sin means that we live righteously. Remember, sin is a transgression of God's what? Law. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119, verse 172, the word of God says in Psalm 119, verse 172, it makes it clear. It says, let me read it. Psalm 119, verse 172. Psalm 119, verse 172, because I don't want to misquote it. Amen. Psalm 119, verse 172. I know what it says, but here it is. Psalm 119, verse 172. The word of God says, my tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness. So in other words, brothers and sisters, to sin not means to live righteously. Amen. So God is calling us to live righteously. And when I receive Christ into my life, when I receive Jesus, I receive the power to live righteously. Ahead, Amen. 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 What is that law a reflection of? It is a reflection of God's character. God is good. According to Luke 18, verse 19, his law is good. According to Romans 12, uh, 7, verse 12. God is holy. His law is holy. God is just. His law is just. God is perfect. The Bible makes it clear in Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. The law is perfect. Psalm 19, verse 7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. Amen. God is love. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 8, that God is what? Love. His law is love. Romans 13 verse 10 makes it clear that the law, excuse me, that love is the fulfilling of the law. Amen. So God's Ten Commandments are a transcript of his character. The law is equal to himself. You can't do away with the law without doing away with God. Because it's equal to him. Amen. So God is calling us to reflect. His law, which is righteousness. Amen. Amen. Turning away from the law of God, trampling the commandments under their feet 
Men cannot know God for the law of God is a transcript of his character. Failing to understand the law of God, they also fail to know the human agent who discerns the attributes of the character of God revealed in his law. So the law reveals God's character. That's from Review and Herald, March 9th, 1897, paragraph 13. So how can I have this experience of living righteously? How can I have this experience? What must I do? To be saved. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And we have it. Please say amen. Acts chapter 16. Brothers and sisters, the word of God is very clear on what we ought to do. The word of God makes it clear. Now we read this still in our scripture reading. Now, Paul and, Sil pa Paul and Silas, they were commissioned by the Holy Ghost. Not to go to this area. No, you're forbidden to go here. They were going to go somewhere else. The Holy Spirit said, no, you're not to go here. But Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, come and help us. Yes, sir. And Paul received that as a call to go to Macedonia. Him and pa Paul and Silas, they went down. They met a woman who was in prayer. They met that woman and they preached the gospel unto her. And she believed the gospel and was baptized. Her in our house. And then. They continued to meet in prayer in that certain spot. And then there was a woman who was possessed with this demon and said, these be the men of God had the right words, but the wrong spirit. And Paul, as he heard that from day to day, got vexed and said, I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And little did he know that that woman was bringing much gain to her masters because they made a profit out of her. But now she's free. And when our masters found out that she was free because of because before she was practicing divination, mm -hmm. witchcraft, and when they found out she was free from that, they said, oh, no. And they took Paul and Silas, a cause to be put in prison. Paul and Silas were beaten with many stripes. And imagine them being cast in a prison. Backs are bleeding. The air, just the very air on their backs, the, the, the bloody stripes on their back, causing them the pain. Whew. But you know what they did? They sung hymns. They sung spiritual songs. And the word of God said the prisoners heard them. So when we're going through trials and tests, let's rejoice like Paul and Silas. Amen. 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 Because there are people who will hear us like those prisoners. And the word of, the word of God says, verse, let me, let me go, go now. Revelation chapter, excuse me, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 26, it says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed and the keeper of the prisoner waking out of his sleep. <gasps> seeing the prison doors open. Oh, no. <gasps> they go. I'm going to lose my job. They're going to be able to support my family. And my friend, they're going to kill me. The Bible says he drew out his sword. I can imagine him crying, tears coming down his eyes. <laughs> Nothing to live for. <laughs> but the word of God says, uh -huh. he drew out his sword, verse 27, and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Those prisoners heard the gospel. In action by Paul and Silas, cheerfully enduring their persecution. And the prisoners were touched, were subdued by the Holy Ghost. They didn't go nowhere. And that prisoner, seeing this, in verse 29, it says, Then he called for the light and sprang in and came in trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sir, <clears throat> what must I do to be saved? Can you imagine that? A prisoner, a prison guard, after seeing a miracle, said, what must I do to be saved? And what did Paul say? And Paul and Silas, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved in thy house. And that same prisoner believed the gospel washed Paul and Silas stripes, was baptized, 
brought him back to his house and gave them something to eat, rejoicing in the Lord and his new freedom. Amen. Amen. God sent them to Macedonia for that one soul. They gained souls in the process as they were there, but he sent him there. They sent Paul and Silas there for that one man. That man who they saw in vision was that prison guard. God brought them there to save that one man. To bring him, to cause him to be, to, a, to hit a point of rock bottom. And where there was no way out. And the only way he could turn to was God. And God set up circumstances where he could make a full surrender to Jesus. So what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus. What does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus? Hebrews 11, verse 6. When you have it, please say amen. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to wear out the patience of the saints. Amen. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But let me tell you something. My time is coming. We won't be able to worship in this building no more. You know why? Because guess what? When a decree is enforced, no buy, no sell. The lights will be cut off. And if we hadn't paid this all, we're going to have to leave. But guess what? Even if we pay it off by God's grace, guess what? They're going to close the door anyway. Because guess what? You got property tax. They'll take, I mean, they're going to take, they're going to, every earthly support will be cut off. So brothers and sisters, we can't take these opportunities lightly. Brothers and sisters, the time is coming where there'll be a famine in the land, not of bread and not of water, but of hearing the word of God. And you better take heed and hear it now. Because very soon, brothers and sisters, I would have preached my last sermon, cried my last tear, probation will have closed, and it's going to be over. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. But he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. It's going to be over real soon. So take heed, brothers and sisters. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. To believe means to have faith. And at birth, uh, Hebrews chapter 8 makes it clear that faith is action. Amen. That's right. Faith is action. What did Abraham do? Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which is to have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, by his belief, he demonstrated it by obedience. John 5, I got to read this, brothers and sisters. John 5, we're getting close to the end right here. John 5, verses 1 through 8. John 5, verses 1 through 8. When you have it, please say amen. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. The word of God says, and this is the man by the pool of Bethesda. This is what the word of God says. And after there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, there, now, there, now there it is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, excuse me, having five portions. And in these lay great multitude of impot impotent, excuse me, in impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. They thinking you jump in that water, you're going to be healed. They had no clue. And people died in the process of getting in that water, thinking they were going to be healed. Went to Christless graves. Mm. Verse four. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the trouble of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. That's what they believed. But verse five says this. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had now been a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The imputed man answering him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But, I w but while I am coming, another stepped down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Verse 9, And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. 
Jesus said, rise up and walk. The man got up in faith and walked. And because he got up and took the effort to rise up from his bed and walk, God gave him the power to walk. How do we apply this spiritually? If we make a full surrender to Christ, let go of the things we ought to let go of, let go of pride, let go of selfishness, let go of things that are harmful to our bodies, that we're placing in our bodies, that are destroying the temple of God. If we let go of these things and say, yes, Lord, I give my heart to you. Yes, Lord, I yield my will to do. Guess what he will do? He will empower us to live right. But you got to choose. Jesus had given him no assurance of divine help. The man might have stopped to doubt and lost his one chance of healing, but he believed Christ's word and in acted upon it. He received strength. Through the same faith, we may receive spiritual healing by sin. We have been severed from the life of God. Our souls are palsied of ourselves. We are are no more capable of living a holy life than was the man capable of walking. There are many who realize their helplessness and who long for that spiritual life, which will bring them into harmony with God. They are vainly striving to obtain it and in despair cry, O oh, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from this body of death? Let the desponding, struggling ones look up. The Savior is bending over the purchase of his blood, saying with inexpressible tenderness and pity, Wilt thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe his word and it will be fulfilled. Put your will on the side of Christ and will to serve him. And in acting upon his word, you will receive strength. Desire of Ages, page 203, paragraph 2. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Do your part. And then the Bible says God will do his part. It says, for God worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He will give you the will and the power to do. But you got to submit. You got to submit. God needs our cooperation. We want God to do all the work. That's what we want. Lord, save me. Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. I, 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 just save me. Put it down then. You got to do your part. You got to put forth the effort and put it down. Now, if you're still struggling on that point, you keep crying out and say, Lord, help me. And say, Lord, I can't help myself. I, I, I got a problem. Just keep reaching out. Amen. Yeah. And then... Put forth the effort. Remove it out of your sight. And God will work in you. Remove it out of your sight while you still craving it and you still got the taste in your mouth for that gray goose. Get rid of it. And watch God work. Amen. Watch God work. Do your part. After you do your part, say, God, I need your help now. I still got the taste in my mouth. I still crave it, but I am choosing to stop. Now I need your divine aid and power. We need humanity cooperating with divinity. God needs our divine cooperation. One extreme says, I don't have to do anything. Another stream says, I can do this all on my own. No, we need God to help us, but we got to put forth human effort. Amen. Amen. We make this only brothers. When I say human effort, you know what I'm really saying? You and I must surrender. That's all God is calling us to do. He's calling us to surrender. This book, Steps of Christ, tells you how to do it. Amen. Amen. This is a small book, but it's one of the most powerful books that have been written. But the true ground to take 
is that the human will must be brought into subjection to the divine will. The will of man is not to be forced into cooperation with the divine agencies, but must be voluntarily submitted. The Bible echo November 1st, 1893, paragraph two. Now, once I have this experience with Christ, brothers and sisters, you know what's going to happen? There in the Bible were, were two men who were possessed with legions of demons. And Jesus delivered these two men. These men whose hair was all matted, eyes look glaring and animalistic. Because they were under the influence of these demonic spirits. They were with chains, but the chains were broken off them because no man could bind them. But Christ set them free. And they sat at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in their right mind. And you know what they said? Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Please let me, let me come with you. We, we want to sit at your feet. I, I, I don't feel safe nowhere else. But Jesus says, go home. And tell what God great, great things God has done for you and has had compassion on you. These men had never heard a discourse of Jesus. These men had never had an opportunity to understand the pillars of the faith. These men had never had the opportunity to learn the various doctrines of Jesus. But they knew one thing. He set them free. And when people from their community saw them, these people who were once the terrorists of the city. Now converted, delivered. They said, wow, what happened to you? Jesus did this to me. They knew that. And the word of God says, Matthew 24, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations then till the end come. We are not delivered to keep it to ourselves. We are delivered from the power of sin now to share with others who are in bondage to sin to show them how they can be delivered. How dare we keep it to ourselves within the four walls? Brothers and sisters, when we do that, we do just like in that parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite, people who were in the church, but they saw the man laying there. They see the man and walk by another side. See the man in the helpless state. See the man bruised by sin. See the man being overtaken by thieves, but walk by on the other side. We don't want to be like that. We need to be like that good Samaritan. And help that man. There are many people who are in spiritual darkness and they need our help. Amen. The gospel is to be presented not as a lifeless theory, but as a living force to change the life. God would have his servants bear testimony to the fact that through his grace, men may possess Christ's likeness of character and may rejoice in the assurance of his love. He will have us bear testimony to the fact that he cannot be satisfied until all who will accept salvation are reclaimed and reinstated in their holy privileges as sons and daughters of God. Ministry of Healing, page 99. There are many souls going down in Christless graves. And are we just going to sit here and allow them to go down into those Christless graves? When a man can go into a, 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 a post office or go into a store or go into a school because he's mad at somebody and start shooting up folk. It shows we're living in the end time. How many of those souls who are gunned down and killed went down to Christless grave? Who shared with them the gospel, the three angels messages? Many souls are going down to Christless graves. And brothers and sisters. God has given us a mandate to reach these lost souls. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. We cannot reach these lost souls. If we. Are in a lost state ourselves. So while we may present to others why they need Jesus by handing them a steps to Christ, you better take that book and read it yourself and see your need of Jesus or why you need Christ. And perhaps the quick temple will leave. Now perhaps it will leave. The, the, the unkind words will stop. The disrespecting father and mother will stop. 
the sin that you are struggling with on some point will stop. If you will see your need of Christ and allow him to come into your life and transform you. Now you can be an effective testimony as to what he has done for you. Brothers and sisters, yes, I'm standing up here preaching, but the most effective way of reaching a soul is by your own testimony. What God has done for you. What has Jesus done for you? Has he done anything for you? He has brought you out of darkness into this marvelous light. That's what he's done for you. And now, brothers and sisters, you're not to keep this light to yourselves, but to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Amen. Amen. It's your desire, brothers and sisters. To be the light of the world, to share with others what Jesus has done for you. Is it your desire to allow Jesus to come into your life, into your heart? And take away those things that should not be there to remove the dross of sin and cause us to reflect his righteousness. If it's your desire, please stand to your feet. We need Jesus. Brothers and sisters, would you rather have Jesus than anything that this world affords today? Would you rather have Jesus than than worldwide fame? Would you rather have Jesus than to be the king or queen of a vast domain? Or to be held in? Brother and sister, do you need Jesus? Do you see your need? Father in heaven, we're standing here and we are kneeling because we see our need of you. So Lord, please help us. Create within us a clean heart, O God, and renew our right spirit within us. Take not your Holy Spirit away from us. Please, Lord, we need you now more than ever. Move upon every soul, move upon every heart and mind of the individual. Lord, we know individuals that should be here, but Satan has caused distractions. Because we realize we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Satan saw the notes of the sermon and said, aha, I got to stop him from preaching that message. Satan will put sleepiness on the minister to cause him to fall asleep while trying to get the message together. We're in a real warfare. So Lord, help us to pray for one another. Help us to pray for the pastors of this church. Because Satan wants to take us all out. One by one. But Lord, we thank you for what you're doing and that you're in total control and you have more power than the enemy. And Lord, you have already won this warfare. The only thing we have to do is choose to be on your side. And Lord, we're standing to our feet and raising our hands saying we choose to be on your side. We're saying, yes, Lord, we give our hearts to you. Yes, Lord, we our wills, we yield anew. Love me, guide me, fill my soul. Yes, Lord, take full control. Help us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.